Good evening. This is the August 20th, 2013 meetup, the Austin Constitution meetup. I'm John Rowland, and uh, we have several topics for this evening. I'll start off with one, and then we will cover the others in separate videos. The first topic this evening is presidential eligibility. This is recently been getting a lot of attention. <clears throat> of course, everyone is aware of the controversy concerning Barack Obama and John McCain, but it, now it's come up with other potential candidates for president in the 2014 election. Uh, I'm sorry, 2016 election. Uh, <clears throat> so things are starting early. <clears throat> and to fact, today, uh, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas uh, was uh, answering questions about it in a news conference in which he pointed out that he was in fact born in Calgary, Canada, but that his mother was born in Delaware and that he was a dual U.S. and Canadian citizen because of his mother's birth as far as Canada was concerned. Now, <clears throat> The question arises whether he, in that situation, is a natural born citizen. In Article 2 of the Constitution, it provides that no person except a natural born citizen or someone who has been a citizen at the time the Constitution was founded, all of course are, are dead now, uh, or has attained the age of 35 years, or is a citizen and presently a citizen of the United States, shall be eligible to be president of the United States. Now, the problem turns on the, the definition of the phrase natural born citizen. And that is what I'm going to be discussing this evening. I have a uh, page on the subject at constitution.org. If you go to that home page and uh, scroll down, you'll see a link to presidential eligibility and you'll get to this page. And it's been getting a lot of page views lately. So uh, evidently people are finding it and uh, finding it useful. Now what I've tried to do is to write it as a kind of law review article. Although instead of using footnotes, I use links. So the, uh, the links are in the body of the text and they go directly to the source documents. Uh, now, for John McCain, the issue was whether he was uh, a U.S. citizen, a natural born citizen, because he was born in the Panama Canal Zone. That fact is not disputed. He was born to parents who were U.S. citizens. In fact, his father was in the military. But the Panama Canal Zone was not U.S. soil. And thus, uh, if we define natural born citizen to mean born on U.S. soil, which is the original definition in English and therefore American law, then uh, he was not natural born. He was, however, made a citizen at birth by a statute that actually was passed after he was born. In other words, that it was retroactive, making persons in his situation citizens at birth. But it's a naturalization statute. It's and naturalization and natural birth are two different things. So, here's what the Constitution says. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5. No person except a natural born citizen or the citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible for the office of president, neither shall any person be eligible for that office who shall not have attained the age of 35 years 
I've been 14 years a resident within the United States. So, in, Article, in the 14th Amendment, Section 1, it says that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So the question naturally arises whether the 14th Amendment somehow modifies uh, Article 2, the eligibility clause. And the answer is it does not. It only talks about citizenship and not natural born citizenship. <clears throat> now, the authority or authorities generally cited by the founders when they were writing the Constitution are William Blackstone, who wrote a four volume set of called Commentaries on the Law of England, which was the main authority for most law and lawyers in England and the United States at that time, especially in, in the United States because they didn't have the advantage of uh, uh, law libraries with all the cases and records of cases that could be consulted to in order to get precedence. So in many ways, the American colonies were striking out on a new path just because they could only carry so much of the law of England with them to the colonies. They didn't have enough books uh, to look up things in. And uh, here's what Blackstone had to say about it. He was talking about subjects. He didn't use the word citizen. Of course, subject would be the appropriate word <coughs> for uh, a citizen of England. But subject and citizen means essentially the same thing uh, for purposes of the Constitution. When the, when the uh, American colonies declared independence, uh, they ended the sovereignty of the monarch and replaced it with the sovereignty of the people. And that's, it's at that point that they started calling themselves citizens rather than subjects. Uh, But the, pur the purpose, as Blackstone explains, is to prevent any persons under foreign attachments from insinuating themselves into this important trust, in other words, uh, into holding public office. And unless born of English parents, even though naturalized by parliament, shall be capable of serving on the Privy Council. That's one kind of office that they can serve on. But when it comes to the question of natural born, of, what, of aliens, denizens, natural born, and naturalized subjects, I shall speak more largely in a subsequent chapter, which he does, and I we skip over to that. Natural born subjects are such as are born within the dominions of the crown of England. Now by dominions they mean the land. So an alien owes a temporary allegiance, but it's not a permanent allegiance, so, as one would have if one were born on the land. The, most people in that day believed that a person acquired a mystical loyalty to the land of his birth, that just by being born on a certain soil, he became loyal to that soil and to the, any society or government that might uh, have it as, as its dominion. Uh, today, we would consider that kind of mystical belief to be, uh, at best, a superstition. But that was their belief, and that's the way they wrote the Constitution, to which we are bound.
just drop it down. Children of aliens born here in England are generally speaking natural born subjects and entitled to all the privileges of such. In other words, uh, even if the parents are not citizens of England, if they're born here, they are natural born subjects of England. Okay, let's go down a little bit further. And St. George Tucker, who wrote the American edition of Blackstone, he corrected some of the errors in it and edits his footnotes, actually were very extensive footnotes, and uh, <coughs> that they cannot, they are forever incapable of being chosen to the office of President of the United States. He's speaking of those who were not born on U.S. soil here. Now here's where I explain about subject and citizen. We have from the case of Ainsley V. Martin, Massachusetts case, 1813. Oh, too far. Oh. Oh. At common law, all human beings born within the legions of the king and under the king's obedience were natural born subjects and not aliens. I do not perceive why this doctrine does not apply to these United States in all cases in which there is no express constitutional or statute declaration to the contrary. Subject and citizen are in a great degree convertible terms as applied to natives, and although the term citizen seems to be appropriate to Republican freemen, yet we are equally with the inhabitants of all other countries subjects, for we are equally bound by allegiance and subjection to the government and law of the land. Now, before Blackstone, the leading authority for the meaning of the constitutional language is Edward Cook. Yes, I know it's spelled like we spell the word Coke for the thing we burn, but they pronounce it Cook. He had a case in 1608 called Calvin's case, um, in which he was the judge, he rendered the opinion and reported it. Uh, Cook wrote uh, the court case, the records of the court cases during that period, called the reports, and he wrote commentaries in what he called the institutes. And those were the, some of the definitive references on the state of the law as of that time. And he stated that a child born on the soil of England to a foreign national visiting this country who is not an invader is a natural born subject of England. And this is a long quote here, but it's basically a foreign national, so long as he is within the king's protection, which though but momentary or uncertain, is yet strong enough to make the natural bond he had the issue here that issue is a natural born subject. By issue, he means a child. So there are actually two doctrines of uh, citizenship uh, at birth. One is the, the one I've just been describing, applicable to England, to its colonies, to most Northern European countries, and to France was used solely for the law of the soil. Uh, the alternative is called use sanguinis, which uh, was a the doctrine that 
and the, the child took the, the citizenship of his parents, or more, spe more specifically of the father, because in those days women were considered not to count uh, for the most part. So this came up in a debate in 1789 when James Madison said, it is an established maxim that birth is a criterion of allegiance. Birth, however, derives its force sometimes from place and sometimes from parentage. But in general, place is the most certain criterion. It is what applies in the United States. That was not on the point of presidential eligibility, but it does show which rule applies. Uh, sometimes miscited is Emmerich de, de Vattel in his work, The Law of Nations. Uh, the site is usually given in support, basically, of eus sanguinis, is taken out of context. <clears throat> it's uh, paragraph 212. The natives are natural born citizens or those born in the country of parents who are citizens. But he was writing for countries on the European continent, uh, like his own country of Switzerland. And it says, there are states, as for instance England, where the single circumstance of being born in the country naturalizes the children of a foreigner. Okay, the rule of use solely goes back to at least 508 BC in Athens, where it was used to establish citizenship in districts called deems. Uh, the Romans mainly used use sanguinis to organize the empire into national groups, each with its own legal system, although they had to introduce the office of praetor peregrinus to adjudicate disputes between members of different groups. However, the Edict of Caracalla in 212 AD made use solely the rule for the entire empire. The rule was carried to France and England under Roman domination, and the Normans adopted and then spread it to Scotland, Wales, and Cornwall. However, Eusanguinus prevailed in many Eastern and Central European countries at the time Vitel wrote, and spread to other countries on the European continent. It displaced use solely in Britain in 1983 and in France in 1993, mainly in response to immigration of persons of different ethnicities. On July 25th, 1787, John Jay wrote to George Washington, presiding officer of the convention, permit me to hint whether it would not be wise and reasonable to provide a strong check to the admission of foreigners into the administration of our national government, and to declare expressly that the commander-in-chief of the American army shall not be given to, no, the command-in-chief of the American army shall not be given to nor devolve on any but a natural born citizen. Now, there's no proof that deliberations took place at the convention on the subject of the letter. Uh, the Committee of Detail originally proposed that the president must be merely a citizen as well as a resident for 21 years. The Committee of Eleven changed citizen to natural born citizen without explanation. The convention accepted the change without further debate. In an 1825 treatise, The View of the Constitution of the United States of America, William Rawl, formerly the U.S. Attorney for Pennsylvania, wrote that the citizens of each state citizens of each state constituted the citizens of the United States when the Constitution was adopted. He who was subsequently born the citizen of a state became, at the moment of his birth, a citizen of the United States. Therefore, every person born within the United States, his territories or districts, whether the parents are citizens or aliens, is a natural born citizen in the sense of the Constitution and entitled to all the rights and privileges pertaining to that capacity. Under our Constitution, the question is settled by its express language, and when we are informed that no person 
is eligible to the office of president unless he's a natural born citizen, the principle that the place of birth creates the relative quality is established as to us. The, first, the case was further examined by the U.S. Supreme Court in the dissenting opinion of Justice Curtis, which should be read in combination with the dissenting opinion of Justice McLean for a better understanding of the issues of the case in Dred Scott v. Sanford, uh, 1856. The first section of the second article of the Constitution uses the language a natural born citizen. It thus assumes that citizenship may be acquired by birth. Undoubtedly, this language of the Constitution was used in reference to that principle of public law well understood in this country at the time of the adoption of the Constitution, which referred <coughs> citizenship to the place of birth. At the Declaration of Independence, and ever since, the received general doctrine has been in conformity with the common law that free persons born within either of the colonies were subjects of the king, that by the Declaration of Independence and the consequent acquisition of sovereignty by the several states, all such persons ceased to be subjects and became citizens of the several states, except that so far as some of them were disfranchised by the legislative power of the states or availed themselves reasonably of the right to adhere to the British crown in the civil contest and thus to continue British subjects. The issue was examined by the U.S. Supreme Court in the United States v. Wong Kim Ark in 1898. It clearly appears that by the law of England for the last three centuries, beginning before the settlement of this country and continuing to the present day, aliens while residing in the dominions possessed by the Crown of England were within the allegiance, the obedience, the faith or loyalty protection, the power, the jurisdiction of the English sovereign, and therefore every child born in England of alien parents was a natural born subject unless the child of an ambassador or other diplomatic agent of a foreign state or of an alien enemy in hostile occupation of the place where the child was born. The same rule was enforced in all the English colonies upon this continent down to the time of the Declaration of Independence and in the United States afterwards and continue to prevail under the Constitution as originally established. The closest the Supreme Court has come to addressing eligible ability to be president was in Perkins v. L. in 1939. Since there is no law of the United States under which his father or any other person can deprive him of his birthright. He can return to America at the age of 21 and in due time, if the people elect, he can become President of the United States. So, uh, some have raised the issue of the citizenship of Obama's parents. That's really irrelevant unless they were foreign invaders or diplomats. And of course, at the time of the 14th Amendment, they also excluded Indians, unassimilated uh, uh, indigenes. <clears throat> now, some miscite the opinion in minor be half or set, but it only states in dictum that natural birth and U.S. citizen parentage would be sufficient to establish U.S. citizenship at birth, not that U.S. citizenship parentage was necessary for the child to be a U.S. citizen. Most of the confusion over the eligibility of John McCain seems to come from the mistaken notion that citizen at birth has the same meaning as natural born citizen. The meaning is not the same. A naturalization statute can make a person a citizen at birth, but that does not make him natural born. Now here is the United States Code, Title 8, Chapter 12, uh, Part 1, Section 1401. Nationals and citizens of the United States at birth. 
The following shall be nationals and citizens of the United States at birth. A, a person born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. B, a person born in the United States to a member of an Indian, Eskimo, Alitian, or other Aboriginal tribe, provided that the granting of citizenship under this subsection shall not in any manner impair or otherwise affect the right of such person to tribal or other property. The first two correspond to natural born. The rest are all naturalized by statute. The code lumps both in the same section, which is not uncommon. Don't look for the U.S. Code for subtle distinctions. It is not, in general, the law. It is evidence of the law. The code is derived from the statutes by an office of the House of Representatives, the office of the Law Review Division Council, established for that purpose. They don't include all the statutes and don't always get it right. I hear they have naturalization defined, but after birth doesn't mean by an official act done after birth. It means from the moment of birth, or in other words, not before birth. A fetus is not, a sat is not naturalized by statute. Most statutes conferring nationality or citizenship at birth were passed before most of the individuals to whom they apply were born. Some, however, were retroactive. An example of this was that was a statute that made McCain a U.S. citizen at birth passed after his birth. But that is a naturalization, it's not natural birth. One might think that while all citizens of birth might not, may not be natural born citizens, all natural born citizens are also citizens at birth. However, it is possible for someone to be natural born without being a citizen at birth, or even being a citizen. Being a child of foreign diplomats or invaders is one way, but it's also possible that someone might be natural born on territory not incorporated into the United States at the time. For example, natural born citizens of Puerto Rico are not natural born citizens of the United States eligible to be president. While it remains a protectorate or dependency, however, citizens of Puerto Rico were admitted, if they were admitted to the state, its natural born citizens would then become natural born citizens of the United States, eligible to be president, if otherwise qualified. It is, if, if, if it later seceded without, with the consent of Congress, its natural born citizens would cease to be natural born citizens of the United States. So natural born citizenship could also be lost by <clears throat> someone who was natural born on a territory initially claimed by the United States as part of it as incorporated territory, but later ceded to the other nation that claims it. The boundary between the US and Mexico was adjusted as a result of shifts in the path of the Rio Grande River, ceding some territory to Mexico that had some people living on it, who were given a choice whether to become U.S. citizens. There are also some disputed territories between the U.S. and Canada, although there may not be any people born or living on them. Other territories disputed between the U.S. and some other nation are not considered incorporated by the United States, but protectors are dependencies. There's nothing about the concept of naturalization that requires some process, other than the enactment of a declaratory statute. The statute can make a person a citizen of birth, of territory that does not include the location where one was born. That is a naturalization process, but it is not natural birth, which depends only on the location of birth on a particular spot on the earth. Whatever anyone might later want to call that spot or the territory surrounding it, the child is born, natural born to that spot. He is not naturalized to that spot. He may be naturalized to another spot or territory that does not include that spot. That is a change of status and is called naturalization. The concept of citizenship is derived from Citizenship which requires a spot, but not a government. 
the burden of proof on the, is, for eligibility is on the claimant to office. The presumption must be ineligibility unless it is proved otherwise. The direction of presumption is not, by the way, the same as for citizenship for individuals already on U.S. soil for whom the burden is on someone seeking to deport them. On the other hand, one seeking to vote or to re-enter the U.S. from outside has the burden to prove citizenship, although it has been historically been sufficient to do the so forth by a notary who knows the individual. There is no constitutional authority to require anyone to present any particular form of identification, especially one issued by the government, that one is not constitutionally required to have. And there is no constitutional authority to require anyone to even have a name, much less any particular form of identification. <coughs> Names are applied to us by other people. No one owns his name. All anyone can say is that some people call me XYZ, but other people can call anyone anything they please. That includes government authorities. And there is no authority to require anyone to know or say what other people call it. Not that government actors don't try anyway. So we can summarize here. Uh, only the location of birth on U.S. soil makes one natural born, but not necessarily a citizen. The present exception would be if a parent is a foreign diplomat representing a foreign nation, it is possible to be a U.S. citizen serving as ambassador from a foreign nation, or a foreign invader, not just someone who overstays a visa. In other words, if somebody sneaks across the border, that's an invader. Originally, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, it also excluded Native Americans who were not assimilated, but regarded as domestic nations within the territory of the U.S., but not part of U.S. society. They are all considered assimilated and part of society now. U.S. soil for this purpose means incorporated territory. That is territory that is not a protectorate like Puerto Rico or Guam, or a leasehold like the Panama Canal Zone or Guantanamo. That does not include U.S. military bases abroad, the grounds of foreign embassies abroad, territorial waters or the space within U.S. flag vessels on or over international waters of our Antarctica. A person born in Arizona, Hawaii, or Alaska before those territories became states would be eligible because it is incorporated and not statehood that makes them U.S. soil. Citizen at birth is not natural born citizenship. Many people are made citizens at birth by statute. That is what the statute did that retroactively made John McCain a U.S. citizen at birth. Or the statute that makes persons born in Puerto Rico U.S. citizens at birth. Or USC 1401. But those are naturalization statutes. And one can be naturalized at birth. It doesn't have to be done after birth. No Supreme Court opinion has defined natural born citizenship for the purposes of presidential eligibility. The cases cited were either dictum or concern ordinary citizenship sufficient to vote to hold or hold office other than that of president. The evidence we have of the original meaning of natural born citizen, although they use the term subject, comes from the commentaries of William Blackstone and Edward Cook. Vittel is not a correct source on this point because he was a Swiss writing about the rule used on the European continent, Euskanguinus, not the different the rule of used in Britain and its colonies, used solely. The burden of proof is that eligibility is on the candidate, not on the challenging of the elgi one challenging eligibility. And he must be presumed to be ineligible unless or until he can produce the proof. The image of the documents that has been offered for Obama is clearly fraudulent, no matter who may attest otherwise, because the original image can be viewed in the tool used to produce it, Adobe Illustrator, which shows the, the separated edit layers that reveal the history of how it was composed using pieces of image from different sources. <coughs> the Congressional Research Service is not a reliable scholarly source. They are like Wikipedia, a place to start but not authoritative. 
I work with the Congressional Research Service, and they harbor a lot of what historians call law office history. Although one could seek a declaratory judgment from a court, there is no point at which one can get injunctive relief. The only point at which eligibility can be effectively challenged is at the point Congress counts electoral votes, and no court has jurisdiction to tell Congress how to do that. At that point, it is up to the members of Congress to voluntarily comply with the Constitution. It is not work to try to exclude an ineligible candidate from the ballot because people are not voting for the candidate. They are voting for electors, and it is only the eligibility of the electors that matters at that point. Now here I summarize natural born eligibility for Barack Obama. Just scroll down a little bit. John McCain, some discussion about that. Naturalization Act of 1790, 1795 rescinded it. Uh, but here we get to Ted Cruz, and basically I show that based upon everything that came before, that he is not eligible to be president. However, I do find a way he can be made eligible. If a small parcel of land in Calgary, in which he was born, were ceded to the United States and made U.S. incorporated territory, then he could serve as president. It would have to be done before he was inaugurated, and it would have to continue until after his successor was inaugurated. Uh, but if that were done, that in principle he could be made eligible. 